Hi friends! Welcome to Beautifully Bookish Bethany. Today's video is going to be a vlog of my time attending the U.S. book show with Publishers Weekly. They were kind enough to give me a press badge so that I could cover the show. It's four days including two in-person days. Unfortunately some of the virtual stuff I've had to miss because of family obligations but today is the first in-person day and it is right in my area in New York City and I've got a list of different things I want to attend. There's some really cool authors. Today they have one thing that's sort of for librarians and booksellers so some of that content is geared towards those. James Daunt the CEO of Barnes & Noble is going to be speaking so I'm going to try to listen in on some of that keynote. I think that could be really interesting. And then there's also a comics track. The next day is going to be upcoming titles for adult and children so I'm going to try to hit up as much stuff as I can, get as much content to you as possible, and kind of take you with me through the days. I'm really excited. So let's go see what's up at the Publishers Weekly U.S. Book Show 2023. Uh, thank you for those kind words, and you know we are at a, an interesting moment at Barnes and Noble, and it's sort of one of the things that I think I, as well as everybody at Barnes and Noble, is keen to um, describe and explain is the process of change that is going on in the company, so that you better understand what is clearly a uh, an evolving uh, situation at, at Barnes and Noble, and one that is really, I hope, uh, increasingly different to, to, to the longer term experience that you may have had in, in the past. Really explicit in recognizing that Barnes & Noble had become not a very good bookseller. What we're trying to do now is put in at the initial sort of allocation stage when we first buy a new book, put into the stores a small number of copies. A, if it's a major and important book, obviously a larger number of copies than if it's a minor one but with an expectation that the store itself will manage its own uh, placement of that book within the store and manage its own replenishment. That's a big change from what we had in the past. There was generally a dollar fee attached to the prominence of that positioning in the all. How's that working? Um, I think it is beginning to make our stores a bit more individual. It is forcing a learning process. Uh, unfortunately, some of that learning is done through the mistakes that are made. Uh, the failure to have enough copies, the slowness with which the individual stores respond, um, and that for publishers and particularly, of course, authors can be pretty frustrating. Nonetheless, that is the journey that we have to go through. Returns, which I didn't mention, but which is a very good measure of how effectively you're running your bookstore. If you're sending books back unsold, that is an absolute testament to failure to order those books in properly, the failure to understand who your customers are, and the failure perhaps to execute operationally getting those in front of people. We were running at 25-ish percent of books going back. That's normal for big chain booksellers, always has been, always was. 25% when you're not sending back any capture in the ride, you're not sending back any to kill a mocking bag, you're not sending back any Charlotte Square. Actually, what you are saying back is new books, and that was 75 80 percent of the new books you brought in. We've now got that down to roughly about 7 8 percent. That I still think is about twice what it should be. But if you're doing that, you're going to buy less of all the things that you really should never have bought in the first place. And the notion that we are boycotting or have moved away from middle grade hardcovers or from hardcovers as a whole is simply nonsense. Again, a book right saying, you know, we don't stock these hardcovers, repeating this, is, is just nonsense. Now, I do understand that all of your children are amazing. <laughs> so talented. All of your children are gloriously beautiful, and you have a thousand photographs of them on your iPhones, and they are extraordinary. But for us, we just need to curate, select, and if we do so, we will have much better books for us, and that's what we're doing. I love it. We're talking about his new graphic novel series, Earth Divers. No, this is a, a real honor and treat to chat with you about this book, which I devoured in a 
in one sitting, but elevator pitch, can you just give us the uh, 30,000 feet on Earth backwards? Yeah, it's 2112, the Earth is falling apart, the climate is collapsing, all the rich people are blasting off the rockets to live somewhere better. Indians are left behind, and four of them figure out how to go back in time to kill Christopher Columbus to stop America from happening to save the world. Ooh. I'd love to hear a little bit about your relationship with comics. I know you're a comics reader, and you've done some comic stuff before this, and this is your first kind of big mainstream uh, miniseries. But can you talk to us about your fandom and the books you read growing up, and what, what compelled you to kind of make this? Um, you know, I thought I've had any buddy who could draw for me, I probably would never have gone into novels because I love comics so much. I grew up way out in the wilds of West Texas where you couldn't even see no more lights at night. And every two weeks on a Wednesday, we'd jump into the sub Suburban and go into town to grocery shop, big old long drive. And we had to, it was so long we had to stop at a gas station. My mom would give us each three quarters to go inside and get something. That was our treat for the week. And, and one time, you know, we'd done that a lot of times. One time I was beelining the Dr. Pepper case and, um, I got apprehended by a spinner rack of what turned out to be comic books. I'd never seen a comic book before. And I was just like, it was like it just washed over me. And I selected the one with the most you know, attractive cover to me, which was Secret Wars number four, with the Hulk holding up 30 billion tons of, or 300 billion tons of mountain, whatever it is. It's a lot of mountain. A lot, yeah. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, I tried to stick with it every Wednesday. And one of the sketches he gave us, Tad had his hair shaved on one side, kind of hanging over like this. And which I guess is a science fiction haircut, I don't know, <laughs> but it's 2112. And, but I was really captivated by that, because I had never once thought, what's this dude's hair look like? And Dominic, had, he had to think of that. He's got, to, he's got to put a pencil to it. I can't even remember all the things he's done that have helped the story come alive in ways that I never anticipated. Um, what my favorite thing about working with Dominic is sometimes, you know, I'll do a script page and I'll have all, this, all these words in this, in this panel. He'll draw it in such a way that I realize I can just erase those stupid yeah. words. Yeah. 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 You don't want to block the art out. Yeah. It's a, no, and it's a, it's a blessing to be paired with an artist that kind of makes the job easier for you. What you do is you present a bleak future that doesn't seem that impossible. You know, and I, I want to kind of get in your head a little bit. And what was it like crafting that story? Was it something that felt cathartic, or did you feel anxious? You know, what was your process? I mean, time travel stories are to me they're all about regret. You know, um, we all wish we could go back to yesterday and tip better, or to sixth grade and be nicer to this or that person. Mm -hmm. And if we had time travel, we could do that. But, but I think what time travel stories can do for us is they can teach us to live more compassionately, to take care of the world better. You know, to live in such a way that we have less to regret. I guess, and that's what I want to write about. Sandman, of course. Watchmen. I teach. A, I do a comic book lecture, a class at, at Boulder where I teach, and. I think one semester, two, two years ago or so, I signed 16 books. I thought, you know, 15 weeks, 16 books, we can do it. But then I spent six weeks on Watchmen, you know? <laughs> we were so screwed. <laughs> There's so much to go into. I, just, it is. I recently had a situation where I read an article that I found really interesting and well done, and worth a conversation, and I commented on Twitter that I found it fascinating. And what was so interesting about that experience is that people had decided, a lot of people on Twitter had decided they hated the article, and they were attacking it, and the author of the article. And when I said I found it fascinating, they started attacking me, even retweeting my tweet that said it was fascinating. And somebody said, I, I didn't really know who this article was for, and how I know it was for a Tarot Parker Pope who thinks it was fascinating. <laughs> and I was like, wow, man, this is a tough crowd. I think it's such a difficult, environment right now that it's a really good opportunity to give advice and to think about how can we support our authors how can we navigate and you know what should our north star be there was a time when people really believed that any publicity is good publicity we think that's still true there has never been a time when the immediate outcome of bad publicity can get so much worse so quickly Although, I think it's, I've observed that in, in many, many cases, cumulatively, that publicity turns out to just be publicity after a while. It really depends on the time frame, but it is surprising how often un unflattering coverage can, can end up being beneficial in some way or another. We hear sometimes in our online communities that some people say that, oh, well, if a book is banned, that just means you're going to sell more someplace else. 
Which it really depends upon the nature of the book. If you're writing a lot of kids' books, it can be quite devastating to have your book banned from a school community. You may not be able to also be able to come and make have readings. You may not be able to do book signings because people are getting called excessively insulting terms out there because of what they're putting in their books. So yes, there are some opportunities that you may get people saying, oh, your book has been banned, come on this show and or podcast and talk about it. Or, but you can also have a tremendously negative response. There are sometimes books where if a very prominent person says it's a terrible book, that's really good for the book. Yeah, it's easy and reasonable to think of book bands as uh, sexy and romantic, and I, I certainly do sometimes, but I also think that people who won't have access to those books, primarily young people, especially LGBTQ people who grew up in conservative areas like myself, for a long time, the most banned books in America have been LGBTQ themed, even before the past 18 months. Two years ago, when there was that whole nonsense controversy over Dr. Seuss, the Dr. Seuss estate took out, I don't know, six or seven books because they had racist imagery. And there were some, I would say, conservative extremists who attempted to claim that uh, Dr. Seuss was being canceled when that wasn't being, that wasn't occurring at all. In fact, would be quote unquote canceling was uh, certain groups going after school districts, public libraries, and telling them to take out their LGBTQ themed books so that kids can read them. And I gotta tell you, when I was 10, 12, 14, I would have felt a lot less lonely if I had access to a book that could explain that experience that I was going through. Can people sell books if they're not on social media? How important is it? It's very important. I think there are a few writers who can get away with not being on social media. Tanasi Coates uh, comes to mind. He'll, he'll sell books no matter what because he's brilliant. Uh, but for a lot of us who are not as brilliant as he is, you know, we do need to have that access. We need that audience. We need to have that marketplace of ideas where we can engage with people and attract them to what we're trying to say. I mean, I definitely think writers, especially in the nonfiction space, need to be on social media. And TikTok, of course, is the perfect example of a complete game changer in the world of fiction. So I, th I think that authors, if they don't embrace the thing that's in the palm of everyone's hand, which is their phone, then they're missing out on an avenue for people to discover. It's about discoverability. And they have to be there. They don't have to be everywhere. They can pick the part of social media that they feel better doing. They can figure it out with their team or themselves how they want to handle it. But to take yourself out of a conversation when you are writing something that you want to provoke a conversation just doesn't make any sense part of just necessary marketing for the writers these days, the authors these days. And it's one of the things that we do webinars on the business of writing and how to help people, how do you market your book, how do you get your work out there. And social media is a necessary part of that. You know, there is no room anymore for respectful disagreement or their nuances or people just to sit in the same space and talk about different perspectives. And it's really hurting us. I'm not, I'm not calling myself moderate at all. I am very much to the left, uh, but what I'm not is going to accept this purity test where we either put people into a good box or a bad box. Mm. That to me is the most destructive thing that is happening, one of the most destructive things that is happening in society right now, and it's not helping any of us. The irony about that is that is one of the things that books can do is create context and put things in a greater context and create a fuller picture. That's one of the beauties of literature. So what's our advice? What's our advice to people on social media, to writers? Don't talk about things you don't know about. <laughs> don't be arrogant, you know. Uh, write what you know. You know, I am not going to get on Twitter today uh, and drill into Beyonce's last album to pick out what I think were her weaknesses. That's not my place. Uh, you know, that is not my background. Uh, that is, I, I can't you know, sing anywhere near as well as she can, right? Exercise humility. You know, if you are looking at something uh, that's outside your wheelhouse, approach it with curiosity. Don't approach it with arrogance. It is the, the worst thing you can do on social media is be arrogant because people will call you out real quick on it and they let you pay for it. Stick to what you know and otherwise just engage respectfully and with curiosity. But I think if you've made a mistake, you need to immediately fall on your sword. You need to promise to do better. You need to begin to learn. You need to not expect other people to be your teacher. You need to investigate. You need to educate yourself. And then you need to work hard at that. And then you need to prove it. 
I also think it really depends, you know, if, if you don't want to get into the conversation in which there's a lot of hateful things aimed at you, then Twitter's probably not your place. <laughs> you know, there's Instagram is for pictures and Facebook is for sharing ideas and, and Twitter is for daggers, unfortunately. That's just how, what it's become. And if you are, you don't have the armor and you're not interested in engaging in that kind of discourse, then just be an observer, but don't, don't step in the middle of it. But if you do find yourself in a controversy, um, the number one thing you should always do, in my opinion, if you've hurt another person, is apologize and, and promise to do better. In the Authors Guild, we take a legal stance on things. For example, if books are being banned by, they're being removed from school boards because the school board says we're, we're taking this book off the shelves. Um, if the school board is not abiding by its own policies for how to do that, we're going to call them on it. Uh, if somebody's book is being taken out of a library because they say that, oh, this is violating our laws against obscenity, there are lawsuits that can be brought to argue against that, and that is the kind of thing that we do. So I also wanted to stress that if something does happen, authors are not alone. They have, if they don't have agents, if they don't have publishers, they have the Authors Guild, they have other authors. There is, we always believe that we're stronger together than apart. And if you, something happens, reach out. <laughs>
purchase getting that done yesterday so I did it and they turned out great so I'm gonna tag her on social media once I have those um yeah really fun first day it was nice being at an in-person event I've just been slowly being able to go to those I met a lot of great people was able to do some networking I was out later than I planned having dinner and drinks with people but it was a good time and I am off to day two let's go the super secret Octagon Valley Society. And the idea for it came when I thought, what if Willy Wonka ran Google? So, <laughs> <laughs> so there's an eccentric, you know, mysterious, kind of childlike scientist, inventor, billionaire. One of Us is Back, which is the third book in the One of Us is Lying series. And I actually got the idea for this book. I, I wrote the series in an unusual way in that it was meant to be a standalone but then it sort of did a lot of very unusual things and readers kept asking for more. And I came up with a second book and I thought, okay, I'm done. Yeah, that was it. But I kept thinking about this plot thread that I had had to cut out of the first book. Um, when I first got my agent, she said, you know, there's this one little side story here that just doesn't fit and it's very distracting. And she was 100% right. So I cut that out. But what it had done was give like a real explanation for antagonist behavior. And at the time I said, well, how can I write this book without that? Because people need to understand. And she said, well, you have to make this into the kind of person who would do what they did, which was such smart advice and it did work. But in the back of my mind, it was always like, there's more to this story. So I started thinking about that thread and I thought, could it be its own story? Salt the Water is about a genderqueer team named Cerule and Jean who has this huge dream of living off the grid with their friends after high school. But they have very little concept of what it means to live off the grid. And naturally, family tragedy strikes and it threatens this dream because there are all these things that are the way that they are and their rules of living and rules of adulthood. And so I wrote this story because first I wanted to write something really irreverent. I feel like there are a lot of YA books out there that don't really show the true nature of kids when adults aren't around. And so I wanted to write a story that really unpack the true desires of a young person living post pandemic after they've seen us kind of just flop. You know what I mean? Watching adults really make like all of these terrible decisions that just created chaos. Um, I wanted to write a story about a group of friends who are like, you know what, I actually don't want to participate. I actually don't want to go do that next step thing. I don't I, I actually want to go live in the like forest for a little while and think about my existence and blah, blah, blah. And so this was born of uh, a few things, one of them being the pandemic. I didn't want to write a pandemic story, but I wanted to write about the aftermath um, that we're supposedly in and how young people are kind of expected to move on and go back to normal when nothing is normal. And I wanted to write a book uh, for the kids that just really do not want to participate. They want something new, they want something different, um, and they don't want anything pre-prescribed for them anymore. And I specifically wrote Salt the Water in a way where it does not give the reader the ending that they might um, be expecting because I really feel like there is no answer to the, the problem that Cerulean has in this story. I know that some of my audience will get that. Some of my audience is used to there's an aside within an aside within an aside and then we'll come back, right? And I think some folks might really want the, I want it to go in this timely order and I want the action to follow in this way. And so I had to be mindful of balance. How do I make some concessions? because I need my, my reader to be with me. I want them to stay here in this story and think about what I'm thinking about. And I also have to be like, if you don't want to do the work, that's on you. I, I can't, you know, I'm doing the work. I am asking you to read a thing you may not have read in a way you may not have read it because you don't know this community in this way. Um, and if you can't do that, that's okay. There's so many other good books you can read. There's this push and pull when it comes to audience where it's like, I want them to really get it, and I also am okay that it might not be for everyone because I'm trying um, and I'm being very ambitious in, in the story. I'm a little different because uh, I kind of have been forced in the course of my career to, to think about audience. I started in newspapers and writing columns, and you always, you don't want to lose anybody after the first paragraph. So, you know, you put all your emphasis on trying to get, get a good first paragraph. 
And then when I wrote the book Two Sets with Maury, I, I remember uh, perseverating over, over the first page. And I worked on that first page for months. And finally, my editor said to me, listen, it's not a newspaper column. Like, they're going to give you five or six pages before they decide <laughs> if they're going to not read it. So that got me a little bit more relaxed, you know. I just wrote that book to, to uh, pay my professor's medical bills. It was not supposed to be a best-selling book of any kind. I was supposed to return to the sports writing and never be on a panel like this. People would just come up to me and say, you know, they pull out their wallets and they say, this is my more you know, show me a picture of somebody. And, and I realized that, you know, what attracted them to that story was they found themselves in it. Well, Maris, this was my favorite question. Um, because it made me realize I haven't thought about audience in ages. <laughs> <laughs> and it also made me realize very quickly after, God, I don't think about audience. And then I immediately thought, well, audience is us. Those of us who read who believe in stories, who believe in the power of stories. The research that I, that, that I did for Absolution, when I began the novel, I, I thought I would travel, I would go to Saigon, and then COVID came and that uh, disappeared. So I just immersed myself in absolutely everything I could find, memoir, history, novels. The first two or three years when I'm writing something, I try to push the audience thoughts away and just try to focus on what I'm obsessed with. And I think when it's all done, that's when I try and shape things so that it's a nice packageable form of like, here's all of these crazy thoughts in a nice package for someone to read and, and to understand. But, but I, I agree. I feel like as an artist, you can't think too much about your audience. You just have to tell the story that you would want to tell. But, you know, a lot of my students, a lot of my undergrads will tell me, you know, I'm so weird, like, no one's writing things like I'm writing, and like, no one understands me, and I'm into the weirdest stuff, and I'm like, first of all, go on the internet, there's tons of weird people everywhere, and like, you will be so pleasantly surprised that people are interested in the same things that you are. And I think the job of fiction is to portray human behavior in a real, haunting, wonderful way, and as long as you're picking up a book looking to read human behavior, then you kind of can't fail, and you just need to write exactly what you are obsessed with. So this is only my second book, and so it's hard to not think of an audience a little bit. Like I had a very explosive first chapter in my first novel, and so on some days I wanted to have that explosive chapter, on the other days I was like, no, no, I'm different, I'm doing something completely different. And so I think it's difficult to not think of an audience in the beginning, but I think sticking to your obsessions is, is much more fruitful. Includes Sarah Jessica Parker, who is the publisher at uh, SJP Lit. Um, <laughs> speaking alongside Kim Coleman Foote, who will be talking about her new novel. Uh, we are so excited to celebrate Kim's incredible work and just acknowledge the amazing new imprint. Thank you, Sarah, for just your incredible work. Yes, I have so many questions, and I think that. Uh, we can just dive right in and just talk about the imprint first because I'm so excited about the relaunch and everything that you've been doing to celebrate the work of incredible global authors. So with this book, Coleman Hill, this is the We can spend book. most of this time talking to the author and talking about the author because she is deserving of all the time you've allowed us. Absolutely. <laughs> but tell me how you landed on Coleman Hill and what really drew you to the story. Great good fortune allowed us to read the manuscript. You all know the process by which an imprint acquires a manuscript, um, and in our case, if they're lucky enough to acquire an extraordinary manuscript, um, now a book like this. So I was alerted to it as we were just starting the imprint, and I think we all had the same re same reaction very early on, which was we were astounded by the gift of the writer, the skill equally and importantly the story that that Kim was sharing with us. I had not read a book about this specific period of time in our history. I didn't know about Foxhall, let me say it correctly. Um, it's right across the river. I know certainly about New York, but I did not understand, you know, the migration north and how this community had in some in many ways created itself who live there, their stories, and the stories of the generations prior to arriving. I was just 
sort of indescribably moved, saddened, impressed by courage and, and bravery, but also, you know, found it incredibly heartrending. Inspired by me growing up in the Bushwick section of Brooklyn in the 70s and 80s when a lot of Bushwick was mm -hmm. on fire. And, and wanting to take a critical look at that through the eyes of a young person because when you're in that moment and living it, it doesn't feel dangerous. It doesn't yeah. feel out of the ordinary right. in any way. It's just your life. And so to be able to reflect on it from this adult perspective through the gaze of someone who is as wise as I am now, but younger, was, was part of the impetus for beginning to tell that story. One of the things I love when I'm reading, whether I'm reading middle reader, YA, or adult fiction from you, is you have this very sort of delicate, gentle, all-knowing kind of perspective. And I really appreciate that because there's a lot that happens in Remember Us, and some of it is quite stressful. Um, I'm not going to pretend it's not. But one of the things I always think about when I'm reading Jacqueline's books is this idea that, and you've said this in other interviews, that we are not living things for the first time ever, that we are always repeating a moment. And I just, I felt like the fires, even though you're revisiting a real moment in history, it's such a great metaphor for where we are and who Sage is and who she's ultimately going to become. So can we talk about memory for a second? Because memory drives the majority of what you do. <laughs> yeah. But what's it like sitting there and thinking about all of these things that happen, but also being able to step back so you can bring the rest of us? I feel like that's how I live my life, <laughs> kind of standing outside watching mm -hmm. and, and then also experiencing or having experienced. Yeah. Um, and I, I do believe that young people are so wise, yes. right? even if they don't have the yes. language, yet they, they are very perceptive mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. introspective and thoughtful in this way that I try to bring to my characters. Yeah. And it is, I, I, I don't, I definitely wasn't this articulate at that age, but, but I definitely spend a lot of my life thinking about that past in relation to the present, yeah. what, what, what impacted my own past that led me to this mm -hmm. moment, and what is happening now that is not new. And given that it's not new, how do we behave toward it in this moment? But how much of the writing is rewriting? <laughs> my beloved editor Nancy <laughs> is in the audience, so she knows. There is a way in which I rewrite more to get to clarity yeah. okay. and more to get rid of repetition. Mm -hmm. And one thing Nancy will call me out is I'll write a scene that will depict the moment mm -hmm. and then later on I'll, re I'll write that scene in another way, but it's already there. And so having faith that I've painted the picture mm -hmm. that I'm trying to paint. But there, there is a lot of rewriting. I mean, I read everything out loud. It has to sound a certain way, mm -hmm. and I'm often trying to ask myself, what is this story trying mm -hmm. to say? Bro. Oh my god, how am I feeling today? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> That's it's clearly that one. I know, but... Good morning. No, 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 good afternoon. I'm such a follower. I just... <laughs> <laughs> I Grill. Ryan Lozada mercilessly um, about his, his books, most particularly his new one, Beholder, which I'm beholding here, <laughs> as well as The Honeys, which came out last year. Of Beholder, esteemed author Adam Silvera said, Beholder is a stunning, strange, sinister story that forces you to face your inner demons like never before. No one frightens, captivates, and enchants all at once like Ryan Lozada. That's so nice about it. I am. So could you just start by frightening, captivating, and enchanting us all at once? <laughs> yes, I've prepared several songs and dance moves. <laughs> <laughs> oh, show. Yeah. A show. Let's talk about books. Let's talk about books. So your, your bio for Beholder reads, I'm doing a lot of reading, Ryan Lasala writes about surreal things that happen to queer people. So can you talk a little bit about what draws you to this intersection of identity and the uncanny? 
that intersection is just where I've always existed because for as long as I have been alive and visible, it's so like 32-ish years, uh, I have always been like a very flamboyant person. I've always been very eccentric and I've always been visibly gay, like even as a kid, right? And so therefore like my identity oftentimes like was the uncanny thing to other people, right? Like I was the strange thing in the room, something that was like ornamental or odd or in many cases monstrous, right? Like I was the, the thing that people were scared would like to move a little too quick <laughs> in like third grade, right? Uh, and I've always been pretty self-possessed and like I thank God for a lot of my teachers and uh, my parents who always gave me a very firm sense of identity. And so through all of that, I've always been like pretty unwavering, but I had an acute sense of the fact that reality for other people was bending when I would open my mouth and when I would assert that like, oh, by the way, I'm real. I am real. We can't not say gay because I, I will exist no matter what, right? And when it came to deciding kind of what I wanted to to write, I, I just love the idea of taking this idea that like surreality oftentimes, if you think about like our assumptions around like what's surreal, um, we think about someone who is in a normal situation when suddenly something goes a little bit awry. And the, uh, the appeal of this to like a reader oftentimes is that that somebody is anybody. This could happen to anybody. You know, we could all sort of walk through the wardrobe into Narnia. But that assumption also comes with this idea that typically that person, when we're seeing them depicted, is like a straight white person. And I love this idea of taking characters that are queer and putting them in these situations where they're just a little off, where something is just a little wrong, and seeing what they do about it. And my finding in my own life and just in the exploration of like fiction that my work comprises is that queer people are going to handle things differently, especially when put into horrific settings. So for instance, in The Honeys, The Honeys is about a kid whose sister dies very suddenly, and to figure out what happened to his sister, he attends the summer camp where she was being initiated into this kind of like pseudo cult of popular girls who call themselves the honeys and they're called this because they take care of a beehive behind their cabin uh, and this this cabin of girls has sort of done this for like hundreds of years it's a, it's a tradition and for me it was thinking well who better to sort of second guess the traditions that are predicated on like gender binaries which summer camps are largely binary uh, than a gender fluid teen who is sort of propelled by grief against one of the most like nostalgic and cherished institutions of american culture which is summer camp it's a really different story if it's told through a queer lens versus just a kid that shows up and doesn't know better than to question anything. Uh, similarly, Beholder starts with a kid at a party that he shouldn't be at in New York City when things go awry and he ends up being the only survivor of what turns out to be a ritualistic killing at this party. And because he's the only survivor, he's also the only suspect of the person behind it. Uh, and this leads him on a mystery that kind of goes through many different sort of dimensions of New York City in an effort to kind of figure out what supernatural thing is plaguing the people in, as it turns out, the art world. And similarly, that's a really different story when told through the lens of a, uh, a queer kid who has spent their entire life constructing a persona that renders them invisible to other people so that they're not noticed, so that they're not picked up upon, so that they can walk into these spaces as anybody, as the person that people want to see. That's something that I do every single day. When I walk in front of you, you're seeing a reflection of what you want to see because I would have to be reflective. I've had to as a like a like an instinct, right? A natural instinct. And so this is a very long answer, but to bring it back to your point, I love that intersection, and I think that there are so many important stories that marginalized voices and specifically queer voices should be telling that have so many amazing ramifications of readers, no matter what their identity is. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Vichet Chum. Uh, I wrote Queen, and this is my first book ever. So uh, this is a fun new adventure. For me. I would love to hear a little bit about your early reading experiences. Uh, were you an avid reader as a teen? Did you often see yourself reflected in the books you read? Yeah, I would say I was an avid, frustrated reader. Uh, some of my favorite books that I, I had read back in high school and, and beyond um, were like A Brave New World, The Giver, you know, books that sort of um, constructed these different worlds. The reason why I sort of was inclined towards those kinds of novels is because I didn't see myself in books. I didn't see protagonists that looked like me, that felt like me, that dreamed like me. And I think the closest approximation was, you know, my freshman year. I had an English teacher who made us read the Joy Luck Club. And that has really been, left an indelible mark on, on my work and 
I, I remember feeling like, oh, that's close to how I feel as a young person. So it's been exciting to sort of then take that frustration and energy into constructing my own uh, stories. Let's start with that. What's the book about? And uh, let them know anything you'd like them to know about it. Yeah, Queen is about a 16-year-old queer Cambodian young woman uh, who lives in Lowell, Massachusetts, which has the second biggest Cambodian population in the country. She fancies herself um, a spoken word MC. She's discovering that during the course of the book. And her father's just been deported back to Cambodia months before. And so she's sort of reckoning with that tragedy, that loss, and learning how to sort of articulate her voice and, and, and use these things that she's going through, using poetry to sort of navigate those hardships. It's funny, I think, and it's really sort of, a, I would say, a microphone to this young woman who is um, really just navigating really difficult things and also approaching things with a kind of ferocity and and optimism. I'm back home and that is a wrap on the 2023 US Book Show. I had a really good time going. I met some amazing people and saw some cool panels. Sarah Jessica Parker was there talking about her new imprint. As I mentioned earlier, I have a little bit of footage from that. I got to see Jacqueline Woodson give a speech talking about her latest book. And then they had a lot of galleys or arcs available. I picked up a few of them. I just tried to grab the ones that I thought I would actually read that looked interesting. Two of them are YA books and the others are adult. Let me show you the two YA ones because I also got the chance to hear both of these authors speak about their books, which was cool. Ryan LaSala has a new book coming out in October. This is called Beholder. He writes queer YA and has started getting into horror. This falls into more of a horror, weird, paranormal category. And it sounds really interesting. No one survived the party at the penthouse except Athens. So it follows a queer guy who's always blended in. He goes to a party at an elite New York penthouse and is the only one to survive a ritualistic murder. And it's trying to figure out what was going on because now he's the main suspect. But also there's something in like a mirror world watching him. So it sounds really interesting. It's got like Eldritch Horror. Beholder is coming out October 3rd. Very excited to have an early copy to check out. Then I also got to hear a little bit from a debut novelist, Visha Chum, who is writing Queen. He is a Cambodian-American writer, and this is a contemporary YA debut that sounded really interesting. A searing, joyful YA debut about a queer Cambodian-American teen's journey to find her voice and step into her legacy. Perfect for fans of Evie's Boy and Elizabeth Acevedo. This sounds fantastic. It's a teen girl who's an MC, and her dad has just been deported back to Cambodia. Cambodia. I think this is going to be a really good one. And it also goes on sale October 3rd. One coming out July 25th that looked interesting, I think this is a debut, is The Woman in the Castello by Kelsey James. It's set in 1960s Italy and it is a gothic horror thriller following an actress who is shooting a horror film. Sounds interesting. Coming out in September, we have One Blood by Deneen Milner. This is a little different from what I usually pick up, but it sounded interesting. Inspired by her own adoption journey, best-selling and award-winning author Deneen Milner delivers a symphonic and emotionally transfixing epic set during pivotal moments in American history about three women with an indomitable spirit, stretching from the American South during the Great Migration in New York during the Civil Rights Movement to Brooklyn and the racial unrest of the 1990s and early 2000s. Milner beautifully devastating novel explores three women's intimate struggles with their own histories, with truth and healing, with being a mother, a daughter, and a woman, and ultimately with love and learning how that love intricately connects them to one another. So I feel like this one is going to be maybe difficult to get through, but it does sound really interesting. This is coming out from Forge. Then I have a memoir that is coming out August 29th, How to Say Babylon by Sophia Sinclair. It says, with the echoes of educated and born a crime, How to Say Babylon is the stunning lyrical story of the author's struggle to break free of her rigid Rastafari upbringing, ruled by her father's strict patriarchal views and repressive control of her childhood to find her own voice as a woman and a poet. It sounds really intriguing, so I was curious about that one. Two more to go. Lauren Groff has The Vaster Wilds. This is, uh, when is this coming out? This is from Riverhead Books, going on sale September 12th. 
a taut and electrifying novel about one spirited girl alone in the wilderness trying to survive. A servant girl escapes from a colonial settlement. She carries nothing with her but her wits, a few possessions, and the spark that burns hot within her. What she finds in the wild is beyond the limits of her imagination and will bend her belief in everything her own civilization has taught her. It's at once a thrilling adventure story and a penetrating fable about trying to find a new way of living in a world succumbing to the churn of colonialism. A work of raw and prophetic power that tells the story of America in miniature through one girl at a hinge point in history to ask how and if we can adapt quickly enough to save ourselves. Yeah, so I'm curious about this one. I feel like this is the kind of thing that could go really wrong or be really intriguing, so... We'll see about that one. And then lastly, one I'm very excited to have an early copy of is the next book from Kylie Reed, author of Such a Fun Age, which is amazing. This is her second novel, Come and Get It, <laughs> which like got a pig on the cover. I'm like, what is this even? About? I haven't even looked at what this is about, but very excited. This comes out January 9th, 2024. So we've got a ways to wait. It says it's a fresh and provocative story. Of course it is about a young woman and her messy entanglement with a professor and three unruly students. Set in 2017 at the University of Arkansas, Millie Cousins is a senior resident assistant who wants to graduate, get a job, and buy a house. So when Agatha Paul, a visiting professor and writer, offers Millie an easy yet unusual opportunity, she jumps at the chance. But Millie's starry-eyed hustle becomes jeopardized by odd new friends, vengeful dorm pranks, and illicit intrigue. A fresh and intimate portrait of desire, consumption, and reckless abandon. Uh, yeah very very intriguing i uh like oh and also knowing what it's about come and get it with the like this is that is a very interesting cover so super curious about that one all of these books look great and then i had a couple of graphic novels from day one so thank you so much to publishers weekly for inviting me i had a really great time i saw a lot of good things there's some cool books coming out and hopefully you found something that might uh, pique your interest as well talk to me in the comments down below let me know any of your thoughts or feelings on anything i talked about in this video and for your question of the day i would love to hear is there anything that i mentioned in this video or anything you saw that has you thinking oh that sounds really good i want to go pick up that book or I want to pick up that graphic novel is there is there something like that and I think I showed you yesterday but I was tired so I'll just quickly recap Earth Divers Volume 1 Kill Columbus by Stephen Graham Jones is like the year is 2112 and the apocalypse is happening as expected and a group of indigenous survivors figure out how to go back in time and try to kill Columbus and stop all of this from happening which is a great premise. And then I also have, I don't think I showed you this, a uh, graphic novel adaptation of The Prophet by Khalil Gibran. Very intriguing. So those are the two graphic novels I picked up. All in all, fantastic time. Again, talk to me in the comments down below. Let me know which of these books, if any, has you curious about it where you'd want to pick it up. Let me know in the comments down below. If you all like this video, it always helps if you give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you want to see more. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.